Hi, I'm David Boyle. Um, I was a member of the Old Guard Fife and Drum Corps as a bass drummer and trainer um, for 12 years. Um, and I'd like to talk a little bit about bass drum technique today. Um, Ollie asked me to, to do a segment on this. Um, we did in live, live segments um, during the uh, 2016 and 2018 symposium. Is that right? Yeah, I think that's right. Um, anyway, so uh, there's a few key elements to, to bass drumming that um, there's not necessarily a lot of knowledge about. Um, it's not just simply taking snare drum technique and transferring it horizontally. Um, so we actually have specialized techniques that we use. Um, so, you know, for instance, and we're going to get into this in a little bit, but um, the molar technique, the molar technique is, is great for snare drumming. We love it for snare drumming. It does a lot of things. It's not the most efficient way to play the bass drum, um, the way that we're trying to, um, to achieve volume um, and also just general efficiency. Um, so um, let me play something first, just so that, it, it, so that you don't have to listen to me talk this whole time. Okay, so something that, that I like to talk about with that style is we, we actually play very, very large and very kind of open. Um, there's a few builders to get to that type of technique. We'll start with grip. Um, so uh, Chris Bomber Harris from Sir did a, a little cartoon of me um, after talking about the ice cream cone grip and I had the ice cream cones in my hand with the base mallets inside. Um, so that was pretty funny, but it, but it does illustrate um, the technique of how you hold the mallet. So um, if we think about holding something conical, um, then we want to have about that amount of pressure. Um, most of the pressure is going to be in the bottom two fingers. Um, so we think about it like holding an ice cream cone. If you can see, there's some space in the top here, right? Um, <clears throat> So most of the pressure happens on the, on the, the bottom two fingers, um, a little bit looser on the, on the top two. Something I thought about this morning was the technique to test for doneness of meat. Um, if you're cooking a steak or something like that, um, you know, where this is, this is medium rare, that's medium, well done, well done. Um, but you can feel the, the tension um, as your fingers touch um, farther down fingers, if that makes sense. Um, so we can use that. Um, to generate a lot more power. What we've done is we've lowered the fulcrum um, to actually be at, towards the bottom of the hand, which gives us more power, more energy going into the drum, right? So nice and open like this. And then we talk about a teardrop motion. So I'm gonna adjust the camera here. Um, for the teardrop motion, this is the full motion. You can see that I have mobility throughout my shoulder, um, my elbow, my forearm, a little bit in the wrist, and a little bit in the fingers, right? As this mallet's going around, it's probably pivoting around the ring finger here. Um, so the way that we start this, I, I've actually um, thought that it would be helpful to talk about it in different positions. So if a playing position is position one, right? If this is position one, how do we get out to do this, this whole, whole motion? So we talked about um, a little bit, we touched on molar. Um, this is the, the part that's a little bit anti-molar. If we think about molar as leading with the wrist and letting the stick, um, the beads stay down like this, that's actually what we're trying to avoid. So what we do is we can think of position two as opening up. Right, so if I just move this joint here, my shoulder joint, then the mallet still comes out, but all this stuff is locked, right? So what I wanna do is a hybrid of the two, where I'm actually, I'm keeping the stick more or less parallel to the bass drum head, okay? 
So it's coming out parallel to the base drum head. This would be position two. And I can back up a little bit more. We have position one, position two. Okay, it's a little bit awkward, but you should feel it opening up in your chest and your shoulders. So we, we get this kind of spreading motion, right? So position one, position two. From this position, now what we do is we allow the stick to, to fully rotate into the open position. Position three, which we're gonna get to, is if you lock your arms all the way out with the sticks, um, not parallel, not facing up, but just nice and relaxed, then this is position three. So from position two, we're here, and we go to position three by just allowing the arm to open, right? So one, two, three. Okay, um, and you might know, know that, sorry, question? Um, okay, so one, two, three, four is this approach to come back into the head. So I would just leave it at that. Four just brings the arm back here and all that energy gets transferred into that inward motion for the, for the beat of the stick. Right? I don't know if you can hear the little swoop, but I can hear it on my end. Um, so that's what you want to do. We want to try to accelerate the, the head of the mallet pretty much as efficiently and as fast as possible into the head to achieve that volume and, um, you know, just impact. Um, so watch for that technique while I play that same piece. This is crazy army, by the way. So even when we're playing smaller notes, when we're playing inner, inner beats and things like that, it's still a mini motion, right? So if we think about always going out to this wide open motion, um, and then if you're playing smaller notes, it goes along that path and it might abbreviate the path slightly on its way back into the drum, um, just depending on the speed that you're trying to, um, to play. So um, last thing about that, which I didn't touch on yet, um, is, the pivot points within um, your joints. So what I like to think about is having a rod that goes straight from my elbow through probably to this inner joint between these two knuckles, right? So that doesn't bend this way or this way or up or down, right? So we just get a little bit of this um, rotational movement, right? So when that all goes together, you get a lot of power um, without weakening it, without weakening this joint, which then will, you know, subtract energy from your playing, right? So it's just a very nice, um, smooth um, path of the stick that allows for the maximum efficiency. And if you look at like a tennis player, I don't play tennis, I don't know a lot about tennis, but I have noticed that, you know, when somebody swings a racket, it's that same motion. Okay, um, and I think there's a lot that we can learn from golf players, tennis players, um, any athlete, even boxers. If you think about um, a boxer throwing a punch, you know, they have these straight lines because they're trying to push that energy as much as possible um, in a singular direction, right? So by having this, it creates a weak, a weak spot. Um, <clears throat> So any questions about that basic technique before we move on? Hi, Dave. I came. <laughs> hey, Brendan. <laughs> okay, so um, I'll talk just for a second about, about bass drum height, just to, um, to put this into perspective with it as well. 
I think that the ideal size of a bass drum for a player is where the, the drum itself is about level with the outsides of your shoulders, right? Um, so that you, when your arms are down in a playing position, you're fairly right, like straight out. You know, you're not, you're not playing out here like we used to in the old guard. Um, we'd always have black and blue wrists um, and not playing super in like this. I think that the most efficient style that, that you're going to be able to get is having the bass drum in this nice, um, comfortable position. And then height-wise, um, the top of the hoop is about um, shoulder height. So from this, from this angle, you can't really see it, but that's about where this drum is on me. Um, so, let's see. Um, let's talk a little bit about um, playing music with snare drums, okay? So, rudimental drumming, rudiments are a lot like syllables of a language. Um, so, it's very important to kind of understand um, the tendencies of different rudiments and to be able to play to those rudiments. For instance, a seven stroke roll in American drumming tends to delay. So with that delay, we have to be ready. Um, we, we have to know what these rudiments are and their tendencies so that we can play accurately with them. Um, so for a seven stroke roll, with that delay, we can use that space that we talked about in this motion and it can slow down, um, you know, you can anticipate that the end of the rudiment where you're gonna play a note um, and then try to anticipate it as early as possible and you can soak up some of that time within this technique, right? So you'll see a lot of that, like the kind of float where, where a bass drummer floats away um, and then you're kind of just hanging out if the roll's a little bit more delayed than you expected, um, you know, it provides a great opportunity for that. So um, in more complex arrangements, like uh, you might hear with the Old Guard or the Patriots or something like that, um, there's a lot of push and pull with the snare drum. So you have to constantly be aware um, I try to not focus on, on um, concentration. If you think about um, playing to your own internal metronome, um, I try to depart from that actually. So um, instead of being concentrating on specific timing when you're in your head, I try to focus on awareness. So with awareness, you can react, your instincts will take over to, to be able to just play with all the people around you. Um, and that's been very helpful for me, um, you know, in my years with the old guard. Um, that's, that's how things got clean. It wasn't by, by going through metronomes and, and, and all that stuff. It was by people being aware of the others around them so that we could all play music together. Any questions so far? Um, okay. Yeah, one of the things that, that I used to say about this is, is playing a bass drum in, in a line like that um, is a lot like riding a mechanical bull. Um, you know, it's, it's very hard to stay right there, but, but when you are, it's just awesome. You know, so, so when you're able to actually anticipate what everybody's doing, um, it's a very cool musical experience um, because it ebbs and flows, but it's all musical. Um, so that's a lot of fun. Um, we can talk a little bit about visuals. Um, is that something that, that people are interested in? No, I'm not. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I am. I am, Dave. <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thanks, friend. <laughs> um, okay. So we get a lot of questions about, um, about the different types of visuals. Um, I think one of the most common that kind of everything is based around, at least for the old guard style, there's a lot of variations with different people, um, is the, what we call a half flip, right? Um, so what we do, we can use this in multiple directions too. Um, what we do is if you open up your hand and you see this pivot point right here between the thumb um, and, the, and the first knuckle here on the hand, um, what we do is if we flatten out our hand, 
we can drop the stick straight back. We're not putting any direction on it, just straight back, right? So if you can get used to that motion, you can see that the rest of my hand is not moving very much. So from that, we can just put a little bit of direction on. So if we put a little bit of backwards direction, it naturally goes around without the hand trying to make it go in a circular pattern. It doesn't actually go in a circle. It goes in more of a cone. If you see from this angle, it's kind of that perimeter of a cone. Right, but the hand is not moving very much, as little as possible. Um, the same on the left. It's kind of like a fish going through water, right? So um, to go up, you know, th this is our our resting position, or it's, it can also be a visual thing coming up and then coming down to play. Um, so in the old guard tradition, we, all, we always hit our shoulders. Um, a lot of times we'll have the bass drum harness on there, um, so it'll hit the leather right here. But when we don't, if like I'm playing on a stand, um, it actually does hit our shoulders, right? You can hear it. But just try not to hit your collarbone um, or your face. Um, <laughs> so we come up here. Um, and then we can go to what we call an out. This is called an up, by the way. So we have half, and then we have an up. An out would be a forward flip um, to the, the, the top 12 o'clock position on the drum. Right? And when we do that, we try to get about thumb level at the, the height of the hoop. Right? So... All of these are used in Joe 90 as well, if people are working on that and would like to work on the bass part. So half, up, out, down. So from the up position, it's a forward flip um, going here, and then it's a back flip coming down, right? And then another half. Up, out, down, half. So th that's a pretty common um, thing to fill up time. Uh, if you want to add visuals into um, a rudimental part, um, longer rolls are a perfect um, opportunity for that. In American Fife and Drum, we have a lot of 15-stroke rolls, um, so that would naturally, for us, be an up and a down in the old guard setting. Okay, up and down. Longer rolls might be up, down, half, um, or up, out, down, half. So I don't know who, who created those, uh, those terms. Maybe Bart knows but uh, they seem to work just fine. Any questions? So aside from when you're doing like overheads, uh, does your mallet when you're playing ever come above where you're hitting? Or does it just come out and kind of down maybe? You're talking about doing overheads um, in relation to the center of the drum? Uh, no, just uh, when you're playing, just like regular playing, no visuals or anything. Uh, yep. Does your mallet ever come above where you're hitting, or does it stay at that level or maybe go down a little? Yeah, the pathway, right? Yeah, yeah. So yes. the, the path of the stick, um, I, what I want to say is that, is that it goes down a little. But I think that that might be incorrect slightly just because of the, um, the physiology of the fact that, you know, it might come up very slightly. And that's just because of this lifting motion to get your arm out. So it might come up just maybe, what's that, an, an inch or a couple centimeters, right? So, um, but only to here. It never comes up um, in this direction. So it, it's all about spreading and opening up. So it might go on this, this teardrop path where the teardrop is kind of tilted, right? So it's almost flat, a little bit up, and then it rounds out down here, right? So if you think about that, um, but it, does, it, it moves much lower than it does higher. So there's always an emphasis on, on, on the stick going lower. When the, when the arm is fully extended, it should literally be locked out here, and then just relax from there. So that's, it's pretty much the full extent of your arm without being uh, 
you know, locked in the elbow. So we don't, you don't want to lock in the elbow on that, on that full upstroke, right? Or the, Correct. Okay. Yeah, it goes through that motion. I mean, if you locked in the elbow, I think you would, you would realize why you shouldn't lock in the elbow immediately. <laughs> I don't think it would be the most comfortable thing. Um, but so we can talk a little bit about overheads themselves as well um, while talking about stick height. So there's a few different types of overheads, um, which overheads are. So there's, there's overheads that actually go over your head where we're actually trying to go um, on a path right above our hat. And if you're wearing a different size hat, you know, don't knock your hat off of seeing it. Um, but there's also overheads that, that, that come up um, in front of the eyes. So with the stick roughly parallel um, to, the, to the drum or perpendicular, I guess. Um, so, and both can be used. Um, I think that a nice way to use the big ones, you can do doubles as well, is um, for large impacts. So, um, you know, if you have a sports ondo, um, part of the music or something like that, then it's nice to have the visuals um, to reference the, um, the volume that you're playing. So if you're playing loud, play big, um, because all this efficiency is coming out of the stroke size and you can make it get that much more stroke, right, by giving the stick a longer path. So that, in theory, gives the stick more time to accelerate. And if we did lock in that out position, like we said, then that would be a stopping motion, right? So coming out here and stopping, now we just lost all of that energy. So from this point, we would have to accelerate the stick back into the head, right? Where it's this very mechanical motion. What we wanna do is we wanna use all the energy. So what's coming out of here is being translated back into forward um, energy into the drum head. So Dave, really quick. So you would say basically coming off of your full swings or your, your whatever you want to call them, that would be the pathway that would be going down to the drum as opposed to coming back up because that would be a waste of energy, right? Because I'm, I'm looking at you play and you're coming down as opposed to going up and scooping up as you were doing before from the regular playing position. Does that make sense? Yeah. One, one thing that, that I like to do is, um, you know, instead of trying to define um, – what I'm doing, I like to just use an experiment. Okay, let's let's figure it out. Let's let's take a look at, at and if I understand your question correctly, you're talking about um, the difference in motion between here and the difference in motion between here. Yeah. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Um, so, right. It, it's all just about creating um, the longest path possible um, for the drum or for the for the for the mallet, right? So. Um, when we're doing it as an overhead, you know, we're not going to necessarily, actually, we might actually pass through this. Let, let's find out. I'm, I'm curious as well. Um, so I'm looking at myself in the screen here as well, and I want to see um, if we actually go through this point. Um, so here we go. I think so. So I think that, that all of those large notes still go through this point. It's just a matter of the distance that you get from here in normal playing comes out to that third point and then back in or adding more path to the, to the stick where it actually comes out with that same second position that we talked about where the sticks are parallel and it's, you're kind of spread like this. Yeah. And then it continues to back around, which gets, you know, it just creates more distance for you to accelerate the drumstick. Excellent. Thank you. Yep. Um, and there are some groups uh, like the Patriots, for example, Brendan's group, um, that will do overheads and then play soft notes. It, it's, I think it's fairly obvious, but um, the, the technique is designed um, for, for playing loud. And it's just a, it's a departure from that if you do something else, which, you know, you can do whatever you want. And it turns into just a visual um, look at that point. Um, so, yeah. But I, I think it's it's also too just to sorry I don't want to blow it up I think that we do that as well for for bigger notes so we have more time to come down to play the softer notes so I don't think it's it's just a visual we're, we're taking the time to come back to the drum sure 
any sense. Right. Well, and, and that's what we were saying about um, about using visual space to, to make up for, for delays in rudiments or just even longer notes. Um, so, you know, it's nice for the bass drummer to stay in motion. Yeah. Um, you know, if you're not in motion, generally you're, you're coming back up and waiting for something. Um, but you never really, at least as far as I can, I can remember, um, are hanging out in a, in a neutral position. You're always kind of filling that up with some sort of motion, um, you know, in most cases. Um, so with the, with the rudiments that, that, that we're playing, I think it's also very important to, to talk about, um, I got a fancy word for this, uh, uh, accent relativity which is not actually as cool as it sounds. But um, so with doing things like paradiddles um, that have a natural accent. One thing that, um, that I see a lot in people is that they don't have the correct um, relationship between an accent and note and um, an inner note. So what, what I mean by accent relativity is the, the relative um, volume difference between um, an inner note and an, and, a, and an accent. So you can depart from any of these. These are just kind of the home base for things. If you're playing standard paradiddles and you're not trying to play them with a, a crazy accent and then really soft inner notes, then everything has its certain level. So at a, like a mezzo forte level, you know, maybe the accent is forte, um, you know, one dynamic level, one and a half dynamic level, something like that. But it, everything kind of stays relative. And what I see um, in a lot of those players that, that do tend to, to play um, louder and softer, um, respectively, farther outside of that, that gap, right? Everything is, there's kind of a comfort zone, that kind of golden ratio zone of accents to taps at any given dynamic level. And what I see a lot of times is that the reason why, um, if it sounds like that, um, it's because of a tension issue in the hand. So what that comes out of a lot in bass drummers is a forced accent, right? So playing much harder instead of playing louder, right? So this technique is really designed to be able to play louder without playing harder. So if, if I'm not really changing much in the way of my hand and wrist, um, then the, the inner notes and the accents are gonna be relative to the size of the path that they took to get there. Does that make sense? Cool. Um, a, little, a little question, Dave. So you are saying that the, the contrast difference of the accent and the taps it doesn't want to be uh, maybe fortissimo to piano. It's like more near between us. Um, for for rudimental bass drumming, it might be a little bit. Um, it might be a little bit smaller of a difference um, at times, but it can really be whatever you want it to be. Um, you, you know, for your specific style, just understanding the difference between the, those different notes and kind of having that Goldilocks zone. Um, where, you know, it, it might be a, a one dynamic, dynamic and a half like that. Um, we can try it. Let's see. Here's some paradigms again. Right. So you can hear, the, hear that difference between um, the first. I, I would think that's comfortable for me. Um, and it, it allows me to, to maintain this, the same technique um, without having to change to be able to, to do, um, to play harder. Um, whereas the second time I have to play harder or I have to play a much larger swing um, to get that same volume. And so you, you, are using, you are using your natural rebound from the accent on the, on the taps. So you, you are not using a lot of fingers Correct. You are not using finger control in the taps. Not, so not a lot of it. Um, if we're if we're going to play thirty second notes um, or like thirty second note paradiddles, we might transfer the the momentum to more the front, um, maybe the the middle finger. Um, but in general, we're not changing changing a whole lot. That that small amount of movement that happens in this type of grip with the fulcrum on the on the ring finger allows for a lot of those inner notes to to come out. 
um, without having without thinking about doing this technique. Okay. Right. Okay. So uh, there might be a time where um, where I would have to put it up here, right? Yes. But I can't really tell you what that is. Probably something extremely fast. So okay. it's not it's not a technique that 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 I focus on, or you know that a lot of the the bass drummers that I know focus on. We focus more on things coming out of the 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 motion of the arm. And because there's less less rebound on the bass drum, you're not actually relying um, very much on on rebound. You want to use every tool that you can, though. So if you're getting some rebound off the head, then you 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 use that energy into the playing, right? So that you can be as efficient as possible. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Can you uh, touch on like? Um, I know some people when they say like articulate the notes, uh, they equate that to being louder notes. But do you find that to be true? And if not, like where where do you draw like a distinction between how to articulate a note but not necessarily make it like boisterous? Sure. Yeah. So um, what I think about a lot of times with that that term articulate to me. Um, it sounds like they're they're asking you to play more staccato. Um, so that's that's how I would see that. And for staccato playing, I think, is is a lot tighter. Um, I try to avoid it quite a bit, actually. Um, so if you're if you're trying to play more articulate, maybe maybe it's um, I'm trying to translate this to bass drum. Maybe on bass drum, it means um, controlling some of the, the, the sound um, of the drum so that you're not getting as much ring, which you can do that on these drums. Um, if you play an unmuffled drum, you can actually control that, um, the amount of reverb. It's a little bit advanced um, of the technique to do it, but it just involves essentially how long the stick is staying on the head. So if you think about a, a trampoline, and you throw a bowling ball down in, in the center of the, of the trampoline, it's gonna hit that apex, and then it's gonna bounce right back out. Um, whereas if you take a stack of bowling balls, um, like that little game, the, the little science experiment thing, um, where one hits and then the one keeps pushing that down, it's gonna interrupt the, the flow of the ripple across that, that surface, right? So the most sound is going to come out of, out of a solid wave going across that trampoline head or the drum head in this case, um, whereas pushing farther into the drum is going to reduce um, the amount of reverb coming out, out of that drum. So um, a lot of times that's a bad thing. Um, we want to avoid that um, in most cases. We, we want, as soon as we hit that apex in the, in the center of the drum head, the stick gets out of its own way. That's going to create more volume um, than trying to play, um, trying to push the stick into the head farther, which is what I mean when I say playing hard, playing harder. Um, for me, I try to play louder or softer, not harder. Does that answer your question, Scott? Amen. Cool. Um, Thanks. Yep. Hi. Russ, how you doing? Um, just, you may have answered this, and I think I know the answer anyway, but um, do you ever play, is it always in the sense of the bass drum you play, or do you ever experiment, go into the edges of the, of the, of the skin? Is it just always uh, the center? Yeah, 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 good question. Um, normally, normally I, I stay right in the, in the, in the center. Um, I like playing on calfskins, these aren't calfskin, but if you do that on a calfskin head, it, you kind of run into some dangerous, territory that gets very expensive very quick. Um, but you, you can do it. Um, really what I think that, that it comes down to is um, with your writing and knowing the different sounds, if you just tap on, on different parts of the drum, if you want to, to put that in um, for a, an audio appeal, like so you want it to sound that way, then you can do it. But I don't really see a technique um, reason for that to exist. If, you, if you're going to play quieter, just play quieter. If you're going to play louder, then you definitely want to be in the center, center of the head.
Any other questions? Hey, I have one. Sure. Just call me. Yeah. So, uh, do you ever, <clears throat> or do you have uh, a certain level or ankle where you hit the drum with the stick? So, uh, it, so actually, strike on the surface. So you're asking, like, it, yeah. If here versus striking right yeah um so i i try to and and again i like to to reference um what i'm actually doing rather than what i think i'm doing because a lot of times those things are wrong but i have actually looked at this quite a bit when i was um training some of the, the bass drummers in the old guard um to really figure this out and yeah it's your your fingers are almost touching the the, the drum head um, and in fact a lot of times they do and that's another way that you can self muffle a drum is by using your hands um, you know here if you can see it my, my fingers are actually on the drum head right so I would say that I'm about this far so is, is there any cases where you tilt it more or uh, I, I would assume that the only time that that would, would happen is if you were doing something with the molar technique. Um, but in general, it's always going to be um, pretty much the, the, the side center of the mallet um, striking the center of the drum head. Um, if, if anything, I think it is important to not play high. If you're going to play off of center at all, maybe slightly low. I don't know if that actually changes the sound much. Um, I haven't, um, I, I don't have any anecdotal evidence of that um, or evidence, so. Um, but, but yeah, so generally, the most impact is gonna come from that, from the apex. If you just think about the basic physics of it, um, if the mallet is pivoting here, it's gonna, if some of that energy is going down, then, then what that glancing stroke that's gonna happen on, on the head doesn't have as much um, directional energy into it. So the most directional energy that you're gonna get is having a flat mallet. Yeah, thanks. You're welcome. Um, sorry, Dave. <clears throat> sorry Dave, Ross again, I've got, this is probably another whole subject in itself. <laughs> um, just talk about uh, comp composition, yep. um, which I'm sure, you know, based on composition is probably a whole thing in itself, but, just as far as writing the visuals, are they written down on the scores or is it a kind of a, a agreed thing amongst the bass drummers? Uh, so, well, so things are probably a little bit different in the old guard than they are um, in other um, rudimental bass drummers, say Connecticut Patriots, Brendan Mason's group. Um, but in general, there are commonalities um, from piece to piece. If we have a 15-stroke 15, a 15 roll um, in the old guard, we would do and up down um, unless otherwise written. Um, you know, you can depart from any of these rules, but there is a home base for all these things. Um, we do write it down um, in the old guard with just simple arrows. Um, so like going to an up position, it's just an upwards arrow. Um, we're going here is called a, or it's pointed back um, to the left side of the page. Um, but, and a half is just, one slash two half. Um, those are not standardized throughout the entire um, genre of fife and drum music um, and rudimental bass drumming. That's just what the old guard uses. Um, but it, it's worked pretty well. For actually writing um, music itself, I think that a lot of times when somebody sends me a piece that, that they've written for bass drumming, um, it's a little bit busy. Um, I, I think people tend to, to be on the busy side um, with rudimental bass drumming parts. They, they want to put a lot of, a lot of um, more challenging licks, I guess, in there, which is great. I think it's, it's really cool. But you have to, have to be very specific about where those happen um, because the, the biggest element that you're going to get out of writing a part, um, a bass drum part for to a snare drum part is going to be that visual aspect of the general playing. You want most of the visual stuff to happen in the actual playing itself um, rather than saving it for just that time when, when you can do something. And then you can also do that when there's time to do something. 
I got a follow up question to Russ's. Uh, w when you're composing bass drum music, I, I know what my answer is, but when, when you're writing bass drum music, do you write in terms of, of sticking? Does it, does it match what you would do visually? Well, for instance, like a good example would be Connecticut Halftime, where natural sticking would just be right, left, right, right, left, right. But we go right, right, left, 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 right. And I think that's because we want to have those visuals there. So to change your sticking, because I, I have, you know, my, my two, my brother and my father are both in uh, the bass drum line, and I always write music, and they, they completely change everything <laughs> you, and, and I still haven't figured it out. So when it comes to writing for the bass drum or composing for the bass drum, do you have that in mind, uh, the visual aspect of it as well, the sort of, um, you know, mirror image from each hand? Very much so actually. Um, that would happen to us in, in the old guard as well as um, some other um, different writing scenarios where um, if say a snare drummer writes a bass part or somebody else writes a bass part. A lot of times I don't have the actual rules. I don't know what the rules are, but we know when they're broken. So m almost every bass drummer in the old guard, w when we got together, we'd say like, okay, we need to change the sticking to be, um, you know, and, and it's not necessarily because, okay, in Connecticut halftime, which is... So it's not necessarily because we're intending on doing an actual overhead. Sometimes it would just be because um, of the amount of motion that we want to get in between the notes themselves. So I would say that, that 80 to 90% of the visual aspect of bass drumming is actually just in the playing itself, in that motion and, and being able to, to keep um, the drumstick and your arms in motion and flexible. Does that more or less answer that? Yeah, no, I, thank you. But, but yeah, so I mean, the common ones are, are gonna be a, a pattern just like that. Bum, 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 that's generally gonna be hand to hand, to hand um, or doubles on each hand. So bum, 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 bum. Same thing with uh, like a lesson 25. In bass drumming is, is gonna tend to go hand to hand, bum, 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 bum. Right, so a full set on one, a full set on the other to allow for some of that, that time as well. And you can add visuals in there, um, which okay. makes it a lot easier to add those in if the sticking is written like that. Sorry, to, sorry. So, so the last note for that bump, bump, bump would be like an upstroke off of a snare drum. Bump, 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 yeah. bump. So regardless of whether you do a visual, that sticking is that way to create more space in the quarter note. Correct. Yeah, cool. I never thought of that, actually. Yeah, as I said, that, that's the, the biggest part of the visuals in playing are just, just the playing itself. Sorry, I'm plugging my computer in, make sure it doesn't die. Um, are just the playing itself. So it doesn't really need a whole lot in, in um, writing for bass drum. You don't need to put a, a ton of things to make it fun. It can be fun and simple. Um, there are times when, when you, you wanna write something that's extremely challenging and that's totally cool. But it doesn't, even the extremely challenging parts um, of bass drumming and solos, there's a lot of space in there. We want, it, we want to use that space because the space is the, the visual element of drumming. Um, and the same thing with dynamics. If we're going to play crazy loud, as loud as we can play, we need to make that, um, we need to, to music-wide or piece-wide, we need, we need to show that that is loud and that's not just, just um, how everything sounds. We would call that apish in the, in the old guard. That was our term for that, is where everything is, is too loud. Um, you can play extremely loud in very delicate pieces, but it just has to be tastefully done and, and done in the right section. So showing you know, that, that you're playing soft and then you're, you're choosing where, where to put these um, larger passages in, I think is, is one of the more successful approaches um, to, to writing for bass drum. Any final questions? Well, thank you yeah, very much. What, oh, sorry, go ahead. Can you talk about, uh, since we're on dynamics, what bartissimo means? 
<laughs> you kind of broke up, but I think you said Bartissimo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Scott. <laughs> uh, Go ahead, Dave. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, pretty much my favorite bass from Rudiment is we, we called it the double whammy, um, which I, I would consider that Bartissimo, um, <laughs> which is just a double stop. Um, it's a fun name for it, though. But yeah, I mean that's that's all I have. I'm, I'm happy to to talk more about this with um, with people and answer or any more specific questions it's it's still an experiment for me trying to figure out a lot of this technique stuff and, and try to find out um different aspects of it so the more questions i get the more I, I have to answer for myself with just by watching or watching other players um so a lot of this is is, is based on um what i've learned from others or what i've observed i guess so nothing here is really new it's just um trying to learn from others to stand on their shoulders and um you know try to progress this this art form i think it's um <clears throat> quite interesting we've got uh jim kilpatrick on on today which is great to see or fiona awesome. <laughs> um and it's actually i was thinking just then that obviously um the american uh, rudimental style of bass drumming is obviously very visual side yeah. of things. Obviously, with, in the Royal Marines, it's SR side drummers that are very visual, and in in pipe band, it's the uh, the tenor drummers have all the visuals. So it'd be interesting to see how if there's any sort of cross pollination of um, uh, of visuals or how it's written. You know, that, that, or where you put the visuals in, as you were saying. Um, there might be some cross pollination um, on some levels. I think it's in in its infancy, though. Um, I just think that it hasn't. There hasn't been enough connection between um, tenor drummers, for instance, from the pipe band community um, and rudimental bass drummers. But that's changing. Um, we were hanging out um, quite a bit with uh, with Tyler Fry at PASIC this year, um, last year. And um, we, we were talking about all kinds of different, um, different approaches. Some of them might work, some of them might not. I think that, you know, time, time will tell. And there's going to be more collaboration in the future. Um, we, we just haven't gotten there with that amount actually being refined into, um, into rudimental bass drumming or vice versa. Thanks for taking the time and being patient with the questions, Dave. Uh, you know, we've talked about a lot of this stuff a million times, and I always learn something from you. Thanks, Scott. I appreciate it. And thank you, everyone else, for, for joining. Um, and if you have any questions, you can shoot me an email, um, loyaldrums at gmail.com. Um, sorry, I think Jim was going to say something. Oh, sure. Uh, sorry, I, I, sorry, Dave. I had my, my mute button on there. Um, okay. But, um, yeah. Um, yeah, the, the bass drummer, the bass drumming style in pipe bands is probably couldn't be further away than what you've been um, showing us and discussing with us. Uh, I think they're really intriguing. I mean, our guys um, do actually, in, in fact, glance the, the bass drum beaters upwards and downwards as they um, as they play their notes. Um, I think it's more like baby strokes we play. And um, so this is intriguing just to get your take on um, how to interact with your, with your drum and, and, um, and uh, um, the way that you create all the different sounds. So um, apologies for coming on as Fiona. I don't know why that happened. No idea. <laughs> but, um, okay. um, thanks. thanks, Jim. Um, yeah, I don't know enough about that, that genre to really... Um, feel comfortable even talking about it. Um, I've made some observations of, of some of those techniques, um, but as you said, it is pretty far distant. Um, I would think that, that we might even have more visually in common with um, with the tenor drummers, which is why I brought that up. Um, sure. but, but it's, I just don't have enough knowledge to speak intelligently about it. Ah, but it's great, what you're doing is fantastic, thank you. Thank you very much. Great. Well, yeah, if you guys have any questions, shoot me an email, shoot me a Facebook message. Uh, loyaldrums.gmail.com is my email address. Um, I'm happy to 
work with people um, and answer any questions that you might have. Thanks for being patient with us, Dave. Yep. Thanks. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Thank great, you, Dave. great workshop, man. Thanks, All right. Thank Great you. to see you.